Um, yeah, so it is, it is my great pleasure to have Felix Hill giving the second keynote talk of Star Sim 2021. Uh, it will be another really interesting talk uh, from a slightly offbeat track again, similar to what we had yesterday. And uh, we'll uh, hear about his research and research of his team on embodied language learning. A few words uh, about Felix. So Felix is currently a research scientist at DeepMind and he leads a, a team working and focusing on grounded language learning and processing. And he has a, a very interesting and diverse academic background where he first did pure mathematics at the University of Oxford, then moved to doing uh, a master's in psycholinguistics at Cambridge, and then ended up uh, doing natural language processing, uh, had to learn to, to code properly for, for NLP algorithms, and, and did a PhD in computer science at the University of Cambridge. And he did a lot of great contributions during his uh, PhD, especially on representation learning for NLP with neural networks. And uh, I, I actually remember a lot of his uh, works in, in that area, but today he's gonna talk about something different, so about yeah, embodied uh, and grounded language learning. And he'll try to convince us that we should do embodied language learning more. So I give floor to Felix. Um, thank you, Ivan. That was a really uh, nice introduction. I should say that Ivan was one of those people who was partially responsible for teaching me how to write code. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so yeah, so I guess this, this is my talk, why do embodied language learning? Um, and over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to try and convince you uh, that this is the area of language processing and language technology that you should be focusing on. Um, but maybe just by means of starting, I'm going to consider what I kind of call th the three hypotheses of language grounding. OK, so maybe these aren't the only three, but they're three that I like to con compare and contrast. So we can imagine a weak hypothesis about the importance of grounding, which simply says that if we're trying to build a grounded or embodied language understanding system, like, for example, a robot that does what we tell it, um, and that robot truly understands language, then it's going to necessarily need to learn uh, from a load of sensory perceptual experience as well as from language. So I'm guessing that to the extent where people believe in learning and using learning machines as a path to building intelligent systems, uh, most people would sign up to this, this version of the grounding hypothesis. We can then imagine a slightly stronger hypothesis. Um, which is that even if our goal is to build a any language understanding system, so including ones that just interact with their users through text or through speech, uh, like a chatbot or something like that, um, then even those sorts of systems could in some way benefit from learning from some sort of sensory perceptual data or experience. So that we can think of as like the medium strength hypothesis. And then uh, we can go to the extreme and think about the strong hypothesis. So um, this is the idea that no language understanding system could ever truly understand language, uh, for whatever it means to understand, um, at least in the way that humans do, unless it learns from some sort of sensory perceptual experience or data. So I guess my personal position is actually, you know, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat agnostic between the two, the two, the medium and the strong hypothesis here. And I, I don't, I don't have, um, you know, I'm willing to accept that either of those it could plausibly be true. Um, I think the weak hypothesis is definitely true. Um, but like a lot of people in the field, I, my views have been somewhat informed, I think, by, by recent developments. And in particular, the, you know, the, the emergent behavior of like very large text-based, transformer-based language models, right? Like GPT-3 is the canonical example. Um, and in particular, it's their flexibility, their ability to apply their knowledge flexibly in different contexts uh, and in, in the context of different prompts um, that I find really, really compelling, right? Uh, so, you know, this example to me is amazing. Um, we can introduce the meaning of a word, so far.o in this case, we just give it a definition. 
Um, and the model can instantly integrate that new knowledge in its activations of what that word means, the word fado, and, to con and it can construct a plausible sentence that integrates that meaning together with the space of meanings of all the words that it, it kind of already knows about and presumably has encoded in its ways. Um, and yeah, what, when the model does something like that, it really, I think at least viscerally, it feels like the only way to do that is to have some reasonable understanding of how the world works, of how these pieces fit together. It's, it's constructed a plausible situation. At least we've constructed a plausible situation in our mind from its output in a way that gives us the impression that it really understands the wider world. So this has made a lot of people reconsider their views on the grounding hypotheses that I that I laid out at the start of the talk. But as you probably know, not that many people in the NLP community are convinced, entirely convinced at least, by the behavior of these massive language models, right? So this sort of skeptical view is best, maybe best exemplified by this well-known perspective by uh, Bender and Koller, um, who kind of argue that a priori, or by definition almost, a system that learns from words alone cannot capture meaning or understand language. Um, now that gets pretty philosophical. Uh, so it's perhaps a good idea to consider what a philosopher thinks. And one of the best known is David Chalmers at NYU. Um, and he also has doubts. So he considers that the issue with GPT-3 in particular is that um, it does many things that would, require, uh, that would require understanding in humans, but it never really connects its words to perception and action. And for, for him, that's one of, the, one of the key reasons why it doesn't truly understand. Um, so it seems like a fair few people actually ascribe to the strong version of the language grounding hypothesis. Um, although maybe the reasons that they ascribe to that strong version are somewhat different in each case. But clearly not everyone must agree with this position, because otherwise I think there would be more researchers focusing on grounded or embodied language learning and understanding. And, and, and there isn't that many. So maybe you perceive there to be a lot. But I actually uh, think that it's still somewhat niche to be doing this sort of work. And so I think it's still worth me trying to spend some time convincing you that this is the best path forward. Um, and, I, and, and I'll do so by first explaining a little bit why I went in this direction. Um, and maybe then providing some preliminary empirical evidence that it's a productive path to pursue at this time. So for me, the clincher was just this insight um, that when we think about our best example of a system that understands language, which is uh, humans, um, there's compelling evidence that our understanding is really underpinned and hugely influenced by the understanding we have and the understanding other people have of our physical environment. Um, so you can see this very clearly in the words that we use, and this was, these are sort of observations that were first made by George Lakoff uh, and collaborators. So, um, you know, the, just this ostensibly abstract sentence uh, that's not about a physical situation at all. In fact, you, as we know, sentences like this are full, they're completely replete with words that are metaphorical and actually originally derived their meaning to um, to refer to spatial relationships or uh, physical relationships or shapes or forces or motion or dynamics. Um, and, you know, this is a fact about most of the words that we use. And words in general kind of enter the language with, if you look back at sort of diachronic analysis of, of words, you can see that they usually enter the language with quite a specific and often a concrete meaning. And over time, this meaning becomes more abstract um, and they gradually get extended metaphorically in the ways that you see in this passage. Um, and I believe this is kind of fundamental to how meaning works. And it also helps us to really explain how humans um, and two competent language users can teach, learn and explain things to each other um, or state facts about the world. And, and, and it's a way that humans can learn about the world without direct experience. But it's only the, the, only the fact that these words initially tie and correspond and align with a physical experience that we or people we know have at some point experience that allows this system of information transfer to actually work in our species. So this is not like a particularly original observation. Um, 
In fact, a huge branch of linguistics, uh, usually called cognitive linguistics, emphasizes how our abstract conceptualization of physical situations and scenarios feeds into how we understand both concrete and abstract language. So one nice way of thinking about this is the idea of a construction, uh, which was um, popularized by Adele Goldberg. Um, if you don't know Adele's work, you should check it out. She's a brilliant linguist. Um, and in her construction grammar account, um, when people understand a sentence such as uh, she knocked the cup off the table, um, what they're actually doing is ab activating a sort of abstract schema, uh, which was learned by that person as a sort of emergent generalization across sentences with a similar pattern of words, but also with the corresponding physical situation that the person experienced at the time when they heard that sentence. So in linguistic terms, the construction here might correspond to something like she x the y off the z, right? So we can think of that as one way of thinking about the abstract linguistic knowledge that you have when you have this construction. But equally important is the physical knowledge, uh, the physical sense in which there's something which was supported by something else, that thing is resting on that thing. And then a person applies a force which knocks that, which perturbs that thing such that it falls. Um, usually there's probably some downward motion in this abstract schema and there's a gravity which caused the thing to fall, fall down. And it's some abstraction of all of that experience, which is also what's encoded in our knowledge when we know this construction. Um, and it's having this construction, um, and, and, and in particular, having that concrete physical experience um, that explains our ability to make sense of even more abstract sentences with the same structure. So a somewhat le a more abstract sentence with the same structure is, she sneezed the papers off the desk. Um, so we know that sneezing is normally an intransitive verb, um, but we also know that we must retain something of that physical schema, the sense that an object is forced off of, of the support of another object and falls due to gravity. And so under the constraint that we have to make sense of all of that in our minds and the meaning of the individual words, we coerce them into a, an understanding of the situation, which uh, is that um, something about the sneeze must perturb the air, which then forces the paper to move across the table and off the table, much like a person who knocks the cup would actually come into physical contact with something to knock it. So it's not quite the same physical situation, but some of the same knowledge is used and applied in understanding the sentence. And then we can even do this in much more abstract cases. Um, so, you know, uh, an extreme example would be something like she excelled the previous chairman of the committee. So I'm pretty sure that none of you would have ever heard that sentence before. That's the amazing thing about language. We can still make sense of it. But according to this account, how we make sense of it is again by acti activating some trace of that physical schema, that knowledge of what prototypical phys physical situation is when this, when this construction is activated. But of course, if we're dealing with a committee, there is no surface and there are no physical forces. So we do our best to fit that into this schema and we can make sense of the situation in which it was her excellence which somehow caused a force which then somehow caused the person not to fall off the committee physically, but to leave the committee and not be supported by the committee anymore. Um, and then there's even things like the sense of falling down. And maybe there's an implication in this sentence that the person actually fell down as a result of leaving the committee. Although, of course, even that would be very metaphorical. They maybe fell down in some sort of abstract professional sense. Cool. So just to sum up, um, I think it's our understanding of the physical uh, as well as the social world that is a crucial missing piece in um, current approaches to replicating language understanding say by modeling an enormous amount of text um, and these insights point to a computational approach in which the basis of language understanding is actually understanding the participants in situations that we can uh, you know in many cases perceive and participate in physically so that idea is sketched in a lot more detail in this perspective piece in um, PNES. Um, but one way to sort of crudely summarize it is, to, is, is, is in this diagram and this sort of long-term vision for how we might train a machine to exhibit true language understanding. So 
Um, there's, there's obviously some compromises like any approach here. And one of them is that we're going to learn about the physical world, but we're going to do that in simulation. Now, this isn't necessary. Uh, it would actually be much better to do this in reality, right, in, in, in a robot. But practically speaking, um, there are many reasons why that's, we're, we're probably a long way from being able to do that. So let's make that compromise and we'll learn about the physical world in a, in a simulation or with a simulation of physics, although, albeit, you know, imperfect, like all models. Um, and then let's learn about the social world um, via interaction with people. Um, and let's learn about language, linguistic knowledge, and in particular, the abstract sort of semantic knowledge that we all have. Um, we can also learn about that from text, right? So, and importantly, each of these parts of the process informs and supports the uh, the learning in the other part, right? This won't work in, if this is set up in a modular way. I think a lot of what we've learned about language processing over the last 10 years has told us, you know, pipelines and modular systems do not form well because all parts of the process interact with other parts. Cool. So here's what we, how we went about executing on this vision, right? So because everyone was focusing on text, we started by focusing on understanding basic language in the physical world. And initially, the physical world was this simulated world that you can see here, um, not particularly naturalistic. Um, and, and, and to study this, we applied deep reinforcement learning, which is a method for training agents to move, interact, and behave, uh, which was sort of, you know, part, at least partially pioneered in DeepMind. Um, so we applied deep reinforcement learning to train an agent to learn a set of templated language commands, but these could be recombined. So we ended up with a space of hundreds of possible different phrases and words that the agent could plausibly understand. Um, and we were able to train it to follow those commands, a reasonable vocabulary. Um, although, it, you know, to train an agent like this, it required many things. It required um, cautious use of a curriculum. It required um, lots of self-supervised or auxiliary learning, as well as the reinforcement learning. Um, and it also required the agent to have many, many interactions with the environment, hundreds of thousands of interactions, rewarded interactions with the environment, right? So it's not particularly ecologically realistic uh, simulation, but of course our agents, they start from scratch with no knowledge, which is quite different from um, all of the biases that are encoded in a human genome um, at the point where humans start learning. Cool. Um, so even in this uh, really basic 3D world, um, we were able to notice some interesting effects of studying language in this way. So um, we wanted to consider, you know, when the agent learns to follow these instructions, what is the nature of the knowledge that it acquires? In particular, is it somewhat abstract or is it entirely overfit to the specific situation in which the agent learns? Um, so to investigate this, we wanted to see whether it could follow held out unfamiliar commands. Um, and we did this by holding out some uh, color shape commands, right? So we trained the agent to find an object according to both its color and its shape, like an instruction like find the blue guitar. And then we, we, we trained it so that it had some experience of all of the words in the environment, but it had not seen certain combinations. Um, and uh, we actually found that the agent was pretty able to generalize almost perfectly to held out combination. So this felt surprising to us because obviously there's been a lot written about how neural networks are not particularly systematic in their ability to generalize. Um, so we wanted to understand what was underlining this generalization a bit better. And to do that, we, we actually started to investigate training it in two different conditions, right? So in one condition, which is condition A, we trained the architecture just like a visual question answering system. So there was actually no movement in the environment. There was no contemporarily drawn out experience. The agent was just given an instruction like find the blue guitar and it had to respond with a single word left or right. It's the one on the left or it's the one on the right. So it's basically a classification, supervised learning classification task. Right? And then in condition B, uh, the exact same stimuli were presented, but the agent had to like move up towards them and was trained with reinforcement learning to pick the right specific thing. Okay, but so at some high level, at the level of instructions, the stimuli here is exactly the same. The training data is the same. The held out evaluation is the same. The only difference, and the architecture is the same. The only difference is the learning algorithm and the nature of the agent's training experience at the level of whether it is continuous or just a single image. And what we found, interestingly, was that although both in both conditions, the agent was able to get pretty good performance on the training set, the, its ability to generalize was much better in the case of the agent that was 
able to move through the environment and observe the objects from many different viewpoints. Um, and you know, ultimately, it's a, an MDP, a Markov decision process that it has to master in order to pick the right object. So it's taking many, many decisions in every episode, whereas in the supervised case, it's just taking one. So this already told us, gave us some preliminary evidence that maybe there's something about this in what we're going to call embodiment, something about the way the agent is learning language, which is helping it to develop useful inductive biases and generalize um, in ways that we find a little bit more convincing. So let's fast forward to 2018 when we got our hands on a new environment. Uh, it still doesn't look perfectly realistic, as you can see, um, but at least the agents in this environment can pick up objects and interact with them physically. They're not just kind of like floating bob blobs in the sky. Um, and so we were able to study kind of interactions between motor control, perception, categorization, and language in this environment. Um, and again, we wanted to study the effects on generalization. So we constructed this test where um, we taught the agent the name of all of the objects in the environment by training it to lift each of them up and giving it a reward when it lifted each of them up. So to lift each object, it has to execute lots of mini actions, uh, ex like latching onto objects, getting close to them, latching onto them and slowly moving them into the air, holding them above a certain height for a certain amount of time and then it gets the reward. Um, and then for a subset of those objects, we also train the agent to put them on the bed. So to do that, it has to pick up the, find the right object, pick it up, move across to the bed, drop it on the bed, right? So um, kind of a, actually a complex uh, set of skills there because there's probably, to, to put something on a bed, you know, the average episode length might be something like 35 frames. So there's maybe 30, you know, it has to take 35 actions to uh, execute this on average uh, task, right? So it's, quite, it's relatively fine grained. Of course, it's not continuous control like a human, but it's a simulation. And then to test this agent, we want to see how well can it like recombine its knowledge of what objects mean and sort of slot them into this motor plan where it actually has to, it's a sort of context dependent motor plan where it has to take that object and put it on the bed, right? And it's all first person perspective. Um, so the agent, can it put these hold out things on the bed? Right. Um, and, and again, we were interested in what to what extent does this being embodied make a difference in the agent's ability to make this inductively do this generalization? Right? So to analyze this, we actually considered the exact same problem, but in two settings. And again, here, the agent architecture is the same, apart from in the final layer, uh, where one of them has fewer actions in its policy than the other. Um, so in one condition, uh, you should be able to see um, this is the 3D condition. So here the agent is, you can see it picking up something and put it on the bed. It's a first person. This is the, you can see the agent's resolution uh, is a little bit lower than you might be uh, if we showed this video to a human. That's just to save on compute, but the resolution is enough uh, that the agent can see the difference between the objects and get some depth perception and things like that. Um, cool. And then here's another version of the task in this task. So here we just simulate the same task, but in a 2D grid world where the agent has a smaller action space and has to pick up something and then execute a sort of symbolic action which grabs the thing and then moves to what moves it towards what we're going to call the bed and drop it on the bed. So at some high level of abstraction, these two trading stimulus have exactly the same content, but one of them is instantiated in a 3D world from a first person perspective and the other is instantiated in a 2D grid world. And maybe you're expecting the punchline by now. Um, but what we found was actually quite a, a really quite strong, clear effect difference in generalization, right? Both uh, agents in both conditions were able to learn this task successfully. But in the 3D world, the agent was gen generalized much better on the holdout uh, task, performing at about 80% accuracy. And that number can go up pretty high if we actually introduce more training objects into the data set. We, we, we purposely kept them small so that there was some uh, failure in, in this case. Um, and so again, we've got a situation where it seems like the ability of the agent to make the sorts of inductive leaps and extend up its concept in a way that feels like appropriate for us as humans um, does seem to improve if the same architecture is trained in an environment which is somehow more naturalistic or realistic. Um, so what is it about the, this is kind of mind blowing, but what is it about the environment that's that, that, that stimulates generalization in this case, right? We wanted to understand that a bit better. Um, and we hit on this idea of, of trying to sort of uh, ablate out the different factors at play. So one important factor is that in one condition, the agent has clearly got imperfect information about the world and has an egocentric perspective, right? It sees the world from where it currently is. In the other condition, the grid world, it sees the world from the top down, 
Um, and if you think about it, what that means is that one of them introduces a quite specific invariance into the world of the agent. Um, so, you know, from a first person perspective, there could be many states in the environment which look exactly the same to the agent, but are actually different, right? You, if you're looking directly at the wall, uh, wherever you are, that looks the same. Um, but from the top down grid world, every state looks different if it is different, right? So there's no sort of invariances in the grid world. Um, now, if we introduce this sort of fog of war window around the agent in the grid world, um, and this window is gonna follow the agent whenever it moves, then we actually find that it recovers a large degree of the systematicity, the ability to generalize that the agent in 3D had. So this tells us that there's something about the egocentric perspective, especially when it comes to following commands like put something on something, which affords the learner a sort of invariance, whether it's like a referential invariance, but it, whatever it is, it, it makes the agent's experience more factorizable and allows it to somehow recombine the notion of identifying an object and lifting it with the notion of putting in a way that it allows it to make this sort of systematic generalization. Um, so I think that's a, a physical inductive bias, which comes from the constraints of actually having a body, right, and being in one place at one time. And this is something which all animals have to uh, live with, but it actually has advantages if our goal is to replicate the way that humans think about the world and use language. And I think that's not a coincidence, right? That's because it's more like how a human learns. Um, I should add that this sort of systematic generalization goes against, you know, lots of people's uh, projections, like general statements about what neural networks can and can't do. Um, neural networks are universal function approximators. They can learn any function, and they, in particular, they could, they could, in theory, generalize in to anything. Right? The point is, uh, when do they generalize and when do they not? So I think that these are we shouldn't make these general statements about what neural networks can and can't do. I think the the insight from maybe this work and others that's come out recently is that. Um, the important thing is, is the nature of the experience that we give these networks, right? And, and of course, for a given experience, a given network may well find it very hard to learn a particular function. Um, cool. Um, so let's go back to this long-term uh, vision. At this point, we thought, okay, now's the time to actually get humans involved in the equation. Um, and because this is StarSem, I'm going to talk a bit about the semantic reasons for doing this, which I think are kind of interesting, rather than say the pragmatic reasons that we need kind of loads of data from humans or something like that. So, so here's an interesting semantic reason why we need to get humans involved in this research program pretty urgently. So in the work that I've just described, there would be no plausible path towards teaching an agent to follow the sorts of instructions you see there, right? So I, I wonder if you can think why. Um, I'll, so I'll tell you, the, the, <laughs> the reason why is because, um, you know, reinforcement learning in, in a simulator relies on the existence of a reward function in the environment. Um, and that's essentially a program that checks that certain conditions have been met in the environment before it gives the agent a reward. Um, but for how many linguistic expressions or instructions can we plausibly write such a function? Uh, we know from a lot of 20th century analytic philosophy, Wittgenstein and many others, that the meaning of most linguistic expressions cannot be adequately characterized by like formal truth conditions, right? So there's no way we can write a program in an environment that has any sort of degree of realism uh, to check whether or not the following instructions have been carried out correctly. Um, and if there was such a way, we would probably be able to build an agent using that program to actually do them. So even if you take something as simple as draw a cat as an example, right? That's something you might want a robot to do. But we know that you can't write a program to check whether a cat has been drawn. Uh, the last 25 years of research in computer vision has told us that, right? We need to, it's such a nonlinear function, checking whether or not there's a cat in an image that we need to learn. It's, it's highly complex function that we need to learn from data. Um, and there's no reason why rewarding the existence of a cat in a image would be any different. So in this case, we also need to learn to reward that. We need to model uh, the evaluation of a policy uh, in order to train an agent to carry out instructions like this. Um, and, and, and one way to do that is by means of, of what we can call a reward model. So this realization was the motivation behind um, th this algorithm that we developed called Agile, um, which is a way of um, Train, jointly training a policy and a reward model 
um, and having an agent learn to follow instructions. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't have an environment. We wanted to sort of develop this in a very controlled way. We didn't have an environment that was, you know, that characterized um, the sort of difficulty of evaluation uh, that, that I was getting at in the last slide. So we want to start with something simpler. So we started in this grid world and we just kind of like pretend that we can't write a reward function here. So in actual fact, we can write a reward function to check anything in this grid world because the number of states is completely countable and it's just not that hard to do. But we, we resisted the temptation to do that. And instead we thought, okay, what would it take to make it, to train an agent to create these uh, shapes, to basically put the blocks into shapes that um, characterize some sort of like Tetris-like shape that we know about. Um, and this is a single policy which is moving these, uh, arranging these shapes in, in a range of different um, uh, figures, right? So there's this one's called snake, and, and you can see it's the shape of the green things there. That's the snake form. So we could easily write a reward function for this, but we didn't, okay? The only information that the agent has to learn from is some examples of the correct formation. And those examples go into the reward model as positive examples. And then the negative examples used to train the reward model come from the behavior of the policy. So it's optimized in some sort of joint optimization, almost like a GAN uh, or a version of Gale, which is generative adversarial imitation learning. So the reward model is rewarded to the extent that it can't tell the difference between, rewards the policy to the extent where it can't tell the difference between these gold standard states, which we provide it with, and the states which are produced by the agent's policy. So Agile provided a way to train an agent to do things like make a star, or you know, it could, if you took it to its extreme, draw a cat, um, although we only tested it on this very simple environment. And then we, we set about getting data from humans to put this into play on a larger scale. Um, now, when we got data from humans, rather than considering just a gold standard final state, we actually got gold standard trajectories. And the way we did that was we had two humans go into the environment and interact with each other. And we prompted them to give them something fun to do. So one of them, one of these prompts could be something like ask the other player to describe where something is. Um, and so the setter would ask a question and then the solver um, would move around and find the answer and then respond with the answer. And the same for giving instructions. Um, and then you can imagine that we apply an algorithm a bit like the one I've just described to learn from this experience. Um, and, and this is ongoing work, right? So this is by far, uh, you know, really far from perfect. But using these techniques and with a lot of effort, we we're able to slowly get towards a situation where following human demonstrations, we can start to do complicated things in a big 3D environment with, you know, no obvious way of checking rewards, no obvious way of checking success. Um, so even things like spatial relations, you might think you can check those by writing a program, but even that's tough, right? Like if I ask you to put a bicycle behind a house, uh, it's probably totally fine that it's one meter behind the house. But if I ask you to put uh, your pencil behind the mug and you put it uh, a meter behind the mug, you probably wouldn't say that's behind, right? So even things that seem very trivial are impossible to uh, evaluate without modeling, right? So um, this is a, a small step and some ongoing work that's slowly moving towards an agent being able to exhibit this sort of understanding of space and phys the physical world that we hope um, will be required for, as I talked about, a more complete language understanding. Cool. Um, okay. So we're making progress. We've got physical world. We've got humans involved in the equation. Um, but if you said that the linguistic behavior of the agent you've just seen is, uh, you know, it, it, if you consider that behavior, it's nowhere near as good as, uh, you know, something like interacting with GPT-3, right? It's how it would be hard to argue if you said that. Um, Let's go back and dig a little deeper into one thing that GPT-3 does, I think, which is particularly impressive. So in this example of the FAR.org, what it's doing here is it's, it's combining fast and slow knowledge in a single linguistic expression. It's combining the new word FAR.org, which can only plausibly know the meaning of from this prompt. Uh, so it must store that knowledge in activations, but it also has knowledge in its weights. Knowledge of what little sister means, knowledge of what really excited means, knowledge of what crazy means, and it integrates that fast and slow knowledge seamlessly. And this sort of behavior is really something that people find very compelling and makes us think maybe this model does understand. Um, and here's a real life example of an embodied version of a similar skill. So I'm not sure we've got any sound, but uh, maybe it's not too important. 
I'll just see. Oh, here we go. Maybe we can get some sound. Look, it's the Toma. Both hey, researchers look. are looking at look. and pointing it's to the object when Ashley says the name. Look, where's the Toma? Can you get the Toma? Then Max Where's is asked to pick out the Toma. Good job! You found the Toma! Yay! Yes, yeah, so this is an example of what uh, developmental linguists often call fast mapping. It's the ability to learn that a word corresponds to an object with only one or a few like trials of being told what the name is. Uh, and it's thought to be very important for how language sort of like really takes off in human learners. Um, and if you think about it, it's something a bit like what GPT-3 is doing in that example, except that in this case, the human is also combining and connecting that word with the physical world around it. So this is something that our system must ultimately need to be able to do uh, and something that we wanted to explore in our simulated physical environment. Um, so to explore it, we set up a particular training regime um, in which the agent was initially surrounded by, so in this case, each episode that the agent learns from has two phases, what I'm going to call the presentation phase and the instruction phase. Um, so in the presentation phase, the agent moves around the world, visits a, a set of objects, and is told their name. And then uh, the presentation phase ends, and all of the positions of those objects are shuffled, as is the position of the agent, and then it's given an instruction to pick one of them up by its name. And the agent is rewarded if it picks up the correct one. And it, the episode ends with no reward if the agent picks up the wrong one. Importantly, the names for the objects are shuffled on a per episode basis. So there's no way that the agent can store in its weights the names of these words like it was doing in previous examples I've shown you. It has to learn to bind to across its memory. It has to learn to remember the new names for each of the objects in the environment and then apply that knowledge later in the episode. Bit like the child when it's learning to do fast mapping. Uh, so it, it, to give a better idea, here's an example of an agent doing the task. So it first goes around and sees the objects and finds their name. Uh, these are the sort of silly nonsense names that we gave things. Um, and then it gets an instruction and it has to remember what, what was that called? Okay, yeah, I'm going to pick that one up. Cool. So um, that's how the task works. Um, and the default way we had at that time in particular of creating an agent was to give it a bit of memory across time by having its observations at every time step embedded, so its language observations and its visual observations embedded by small neural networks and then passed to a memory core. Um, and then that memory core would take in those observations at every time step and every time step compute a distribution over possible actions from which an action can be sampled. When we have the agent's memory core being an LSTM, a recurrent network, it fails pretty catastrophically to do this sort of fast binding. So we developed a different memory, which we called a dual coding episodic memory, which allows the agent to more easily um, remember specific snapshots of its past experience. So the way we did that is by using an external memory and lining up the visual codes that the agent has seen, embedding so its visual experience and embedding a corresponding representation of its linguistic experience in a sort of associative array. And then at every time step, as well as adding to that memory, the agent computes a query based just off the language that it's experiencing and matches that against the keys in, its ling in the language side of its memory. And it then returns back into uh, its main memory core, um, a visual memory of the thing it was looking at the last time it had that linguistic memory. Returns the visual thing back and then uses that to merge in with the policy and inform it of what actions to take. And if you think about it, this, uh, this memory is actually perfectly set up to solve this task because exactly what the agent has to do is it, it, it in the instruction phase, it gets an instruction like find a DAX and it has to think, okay, when in the past have I heard the word DAX and what was I looking at when I heard it? And this memory kind of gives that directly to the agent, and then it takes that knowledge and is able to learn the task. Um, but actually, there's a, in, if you read this paper, there's a bunch of other advantages for keeping the code, linguistic and visual code separately in an agent's memory. Um, it provides a sort of space of observations that the agent can separately use to do things like uh, motivating itself to explore. And it actually aligns quite closely with the dual coding theory of human memory, which is a relatively influential theory, which says that we retain separate independent codes um, from things that we have heard 
and things that we've seen. And we retain their correspondence, but we also um, keep them in memory separately. Another important detail to add is that self-supervised learning in a lot of our language agents, self-supervised learning is really important for getting this, like reinforcing the correspondence between vision and language. And in, for these sorts of fast binding tasks, it's even more important that the agent has some train, is trained to reconstruct its, it from its memory back into the observations that it's looking at. And there's some loss associated with doing that. One way of thinking about this is that training the whole network just from reinforcement learning is a really hard credit assignment problem. And anything we can do to build the representations of this network as the agent learns really contributes to its ability to understand the world and use its memory in the relatively sophisticated way that's required to solve this task. Cool, so you can see here that um, the dual coding episodic memory was the memory of all the ones that we compared that allowed the agent to learn this task uh, most efficiently and quickly. Um, but once we'd overcome the problem of actually having the agent learn to do this fast binding, we then became interested in what knowledge the agents have when they learn to do that and how general it is. So the first type of generalization we considered is to the number of objects in the world. So um, we can train the agent to do this fast binding task with three objects or with five objects or with eight objects. Now I can tell you that as a human doing the task with eight objects is really hard. It's these nonsense words and these objects and it's really hard to remember the correspondence between them. It's actually a case where a machine does probably better, a lot better than a human. Uh, they, you know, they can kind of scale these things a little bit more easily. Um, but what I think the interesting insight here is that when it's trained on three objects, it before, its performance degrades when it's evaluated on the task with five objects or eight objects. But when it's trained on five objects, that performance does not degrade much to get it up to eight objects. So there seems to be almost some sort of critical threshold above which its policy for exploring and writing and reading from its memory sort of abstracts into a, like a program-like thing that's somewhat agnostic to the amount of times that it has to do it. Whereas with three objects, it's still somewhat overfit to that precise number of objects. Next thing we looked at was whether or not the agent could do fast binding to objects that it had never seen before. So we evaluated the, we trained it on some set of objects all in some training object sets. So it gets the idea of the task. And then we held out some objects and we say, right, if I introduce one of these to you now, can you remember its name and then use its name later in the episode? Um, and it turns out that it can do that pretty well. But again, it, it depends on the number of objects in the training object set. So in the special case where there's only three objects in the training set, that means every episode that the agent experiences when it's learning, it contains the same three objects. And in that case, it does kind of overfit to the, like the, the particular features of those objects. But if that number goes up above five or 20, then that overfitting subsides and it's able to sort of get a general notion of object that allows it to fast bind a name to an object that it's never seen before, if it, that object is suddenly introduced to the agent. Another thing that humans can do, subsequent experiments on the fast mapping in humans showed that they're not just binding a particular object to a new word, but they're actually understanding a new category when they learn a new word like DAX and get shown an object. Um, so we can do the similar sorts of experiments in our environment. Uh, half, between the presentation phase and the instruction phase of this task, we're going to swap out. So let's say DAX corresponds to a mug. We're going to swap that mug out and we're going to put a new mug in that looks different but it's going to have something in common, which hopefully the agent can pick up on. To do this, we use ShapeNet, which is like a hierarchical structure of 3D objects, taxonomy of 3D objects. You can see it's quite hard to learn categories from one instance in this case. Those, these two are both examples of bottles. If you only saw those things on the left, would you know that the things on the right were also bottles? It, it's kind of hard inductive leap, so this is not necessarily an easy task. But we find that we can train the agents to make these sorts of inductive leaps. The key though, is that we train them to extend categories. Um, but once we train it to extend categories, so we, we so in, in one training condition, we, we show it a horse and then we ask it to pick up, we call it a DAX, we show it a horse, and then we ask it to pick up the DAX and it's the same horse. And that doesn't lead to very general learning. But if we show it a horse, say this is a DAX, and then ask it to pick up a DAX and it's a different horse, that leads to a sort of meta learning of an ability to extend the categories. Um, and we know that it's somewhat general because at test time, we introduce entirely new categories. So it's never seen a car before. We show it one car and say, this is a DAX. And then we introduce a different car and we say, you know, pick up the DAX. And it can still do that with over 80% 80, 80 accuracy. That's the green line you see here. So I guess the point here is that 
you know, our environment needs to be sufficiently rich that there's these opportunities to kind of like meta learn how to extend categories. Um, if we want an agent like this, at least, to be able to exhibit this sort of ability to extend categories that they've only just encountered. Cool. And then the final thing I wanted to just tell you was that we were actually able to get the agent to a situation where it could do something like GPT-3 in terms of mixing fast and slow word meanings in a sing in, in whilst constructing a representation of a single phrase. So um, in this case, uh, the GPT-3 integrates the meaning of the word fardaddle with familiar words like sister or crazy or excited. Um, in our simulation, we're going to see whether the agent can integrate it's fast, like immediate knowledge of what a DAX is or what a Blicket is with long-standing knowledge of what things like a bed or a box are. And bed and box have their meaning stable uh, across all the episodes, whereas whatever a DAX refers to and whatever a Blicket refers to, that's constantly changing. That the knowledge of those things is constantly changing. And then in the uh, instruction phase, the agent's going to get an instruction like put the blicket on the bed. So it needs to know that blicket is something it's, the meaning of blicket is something it stores in its activations. The meaning of bed is something it stores in its weights and it's going to integrate the slow and fast knowledge. And the punchline is that basically, you know, with the right agent architecture, um, we were able to train an agent to do this. So you can see this is a video of the agent. It's going around and picking up the names of the three movable objects in the environment. Um, and then it's going to get an instruction which contains both fast words with fast meanings, sort of transitory meanings, and slow meanings. So put the Montinsia on a storage tray, and it does effectively remember which thing a Montinsia is, and you can see there it threw it onto the storage tray. Cool. So I've pretty much come to um, all of the preliminary evidence that I was going to show you to make my case for why. Embodied language learning is a productive and important direction towards systems that can understand language like humans do. Um, I'll just do a quick summary. Um, so I've described why I and many others think that uh, the big, even the biggest and best text-based language models um, exhibit a somewhat un incomplete or unreal understanding of, of language. Um, and I've set out some of the arguments in particular from cognitive linguistics and psychology um, that physical and spatial knowledge is critical for, it may be the critical missing piece in developing the sort of robust and flexible understanding of language that we actually see in humans. Um, and I've described what I think is the right recipe for achieving this in machines by sort of combining elements of learning about the physical world, learning from interactions with people and learning from language data. Um, and importantly, those need to be done in a sort of interactive and self-supporting loop. They can't be done independently. And along the way, I've managed to uh, set out a little bit of empirical evidence um, that maybe sort of supports the idea that this is the right way to go. So I've, I've explained how experience of a physical world, even in simulation, can help neural networks exhibit more robust and more human-like generalization. Um, and I've also explained that by learning from human feedback, agents can better learn a kind of grounded understanding of expressions that we have no way to express in formal programs. Um, I've also tried to argue that like large language models, um, agents with the right memory systems and combined with the right self-supervised learning algorithms can rapidly integrate both new and old word meanings to carry out unfamiliar instructions. And that raises the possibility of things like, you know, maybe we're not so far from a robot that we could introduce a new object to and tell it the name of that object. And it could seamlessly put that object into its repertoire of motor skills so that from then on, it could always like, move that object, interact with that object, put it where we wanted and things like that. Um, and finally, I just want to emphasize that there's a huge way to go with this, right? We're nowhere near where we need to be to kind of make the case that um, this is the ultimately the way to get a more fundamental, more realistic and a more rich, complete understanding of language. Um, you know, and at the moment, the people training bigger and bigger text based models are kind of in the lead in the sense that um, the behavior that their, their models are exhibiting is compelling and it is interesting. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work to do. So hopefully some of you will be um, inspired to take a bit of a detour into this direction. Um, I just want to thank my numerous collaborators and team. Here's a small sample of them, but there's actually loads more that I wasn't um, able to put on this slide. 
and uh, maybe we've got time for uh, a few questions. Thanks a lot, Felix, for, for the amazing talk. Uh, I felt like watching a documentary uh, on embodied language learning. So uh, we have some time for questions now. Uh, feel free to ask uh, uh, questions via chat or just raising your hands directly and uh, yeah, just asking Felix directly. So um, yeah, we can start with the QA. Uh, uh, okay, so I think there's a question from Frank. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, yeah, hi, thanks. Really amazing talk. Um, I was wondering, thinking about the visual input you provide when doing this research, do you think there's a point where you could provide a model with too much sensory information? I'm just thinking about the robotics field where they quite often struggle with data fusion from different sensors and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's loads more research to be done on those questions. Um, humans have very specialized systems, but they, that, but they also have like very specialized perceptual systems but that, that also permit and integrate information from from other systems. So it, it, it feels like there needs to be some compromise. And like uh, there's evidence in other, we don't have it in the agents I described here, but there's evidence that for example, more object centric representations of the sort that might be estimated by um, object estimation algorithms um, could really benefit uh, agents on a lot of these tasks. Um, so that's one, one place where the visual area could be like a little bit like in some sense it's abstracting and reducing the amount of information coming through that channel. Um, yeah, I, I, my personal intuition is that more is always better in the sense that, um, you know, learning is an exercise in exploiting all the clues that are available to us. And um, I do think there's loads of unexplored questions around things like how does sound help us to know that an object is an object? You know, like just things when things fall, there's a noise that tells us that we should put our attention on that event. Uh, and as a learner, that tells us there's been an, you know, an important contact between two physical things. And all of this information, I think, is probably um, relevant to humans, especially at early stages in their life. Um, so my intuition is that if we want to go from the bottom up, like more is always better, but we do need very good algorithms for coping with all that information. Um, on the other hand, if we have a very a more narrow problem and we need to get to a solution quickly, you know, maybe more is not better. Um, but you know, when people are criticizing these large language models, I, I don't think they're getting, they're not, hint, they're not, they're not looking for like something to, to work really. They're, they're talking about some essential lacking of understanding. And I think if we take too many shortcuts, things like um, bounding box object detectors or cutting out certain modalities, um, we might get a system which works for a particular thing, but I don't think we'll solve the bigger problem that eventually satisfies, you know, um, the uh, purists that there's a real and complete human-like understanding of what's going on in these situations. That's my, mm -hmm. that's my intuition, but it's a good question. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, any other question? So yeah, we still have uh, quite some time for questions. Yeah, can, can I go ahead? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Okay. Um, Hi, Felix. Uh, I, hey, enjoyed you know. I, I enjoyed a lot listening to your talk um, and to see how, you, how this direction is ma making progress. I, I actually have a, a more uh, question about a concrete aspect that uh, um, you referred to. Um, I, I'm referring to the point where you showed that uh, when the agent was like embodied in a more realistic setting, uh, like the 3D, and the egocentric uh, perspective versus like a um, kind of an overview a grid view. Uh, it, it generalized better um, in the kind of embodied situation. And also when you made it kind of uh, have limited view in the grid uh, scenario also, it improved generalization. And you kind of attributed that to the kind of embodiment that people you know, experience but, but I wonder if it, if it might be a more generic principle that may also be useful in other settings. Uh, 
that it's that uh, possibly when the agent is exposed to less information where there is more uncertainty and in a sense the signal is weaker relative to the complexity of the environment then it's kind of being pushed to generalize because otherwise you know you can get along with uh, overfitting um, and that might be you know you know and that might be actually the general principle and it's it's the case that you know humans embodied in complex environment you know satisfy this property um, but if it's a more general principle i just wonder also whether we can learn the lesson you know there might be other cases where the issue is not about being embodied or not embodied but rather kind of what the, the complexity relative to the um, kind of to the horizon or or, or uh, landscape of 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 the learner uh, that trying to put the learner in some kind of deficiency relative to the complexity is a good principle to tangentialization. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Like, I, I don't think you can really separate my proposal, proposed conclusions from your uh, proposed conclusion it, from the evidence we have there. Um, I actually think, you know, in the limit, what you're describing would refer to, maybe would 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 cover any type of regularization, right? You you either make the, as the learner gets better, you're either making the problem harder uh, or, or constraining it or crippling it in some way such that the, but just, just enough so that the learner can still solve the problem, probably it will generalize better. And even things like dropout and other regularization methods, are probably an example of that in some sense. Um, but I guess I was hoping that there's something more specific at play here. Um, and I, but it is quite subtle and I, and I haven't found a good way of explaining it really clearly. But I wonder if there's something about language because we language evolved, you know, such that animals which are situated in a particular place talk to other animals. A lot of it has this kind of deictic property where we talk about the relationship between an object and ourselves. And, and and then the fact the important factor is the object and that can be in for other objects. And I, I, I'm not expressing myself very clearly, but I just wonder whether there, there's actually some, like the type of generalization I want to, um, the language talks about, put the ball on the tray, put the cup on the bed. It, it refers to a process where it's very first person in terms of the actions I have to take, I have to go myself up to an object and take that thing. And then I have to experience moving across the world with it. And I have to experience putting that down. And I just wonder if that somehow, you know, when you do that from a first person point of view, you, you're getting just the infam you're getting just the real experience of doing exactly that. Whereas there's so much other stuff you're getting if you're seeing the whole world. You maybe, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, ex I'm not ex explaining myself too clearly, but I just wonder if there's something almost that, that where language is also a first person phenomenon. And, and it's yeah. the combination of language and being first person, which is actually quite complementary. Um, yeah, who knows? <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree that with respect to, to the evidence you brought, you cannot distinguish between the kind of two conjectures. But uh, I also agree that your conjecture about the specifics of general, making generalizations uh, over language structure um, is an intriguing one. Uh, probably you can't prove it yet, but uh, I, I get your intuition for why you you hope that you know moving in that direction might end up being helpful. Thanks, thanks. That was Thank illuminating. Uh, we might have time for one quick question still. If somebody has a question, uh, oh, there is one. Uh, yeah, just go ahead. Hi, that was such a wonderful talk. So I guess I just have like a very abstract, general question, which is. Do you think this interaction between modalities, for example, like language and vision or being grounded and situated in an environment needs to happen at the same time? Or do you think there's hope to maybe take a model that's been trained only on text, like a GPT-3 like model and teach it maybe in like a space of colors or a space of different worlds, um, teach it what it means to be grounded? Or do you think there are still like fundamental components that it might miss in those settings? So just what are your thoughts on trying to do something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm arguing with people about this all the time. I mean, not arguing in the sense that I don't, I, I don't know the answer. I know that there's a lot of people in in um, in DeepMind who who advocate sort of learning all of the animal-like common sense first and not having language involved. Um, I think if you're trying to model evolution, that's probably exactly like the right order. But um, I don't think that fits with. Firstly, the learning machines that we put into these problems 
are not like animals. And so they, they find, for example, you know, certain high level cognitive tasks very easy, uh, but they can't do basic motor skills. So, you know, like we know they're not like animals, so it's not necessarily right to set up an exactly like evolution, like trajectory, like learn only the spatial physical stuff first, then eventually learn the language. Um, also, just the, the data that exists in the world is not that doesn't have that distribution, right? Like, there's so much more text available that 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 I think um, that, that, that you know I think that that's a good argument for involving language in the process early on. And finally, at least in within the generation of current humans, the 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 learning of these things does interact a lot, right? So we don't learn too much about the physical world independently of language. Actually, it's always there from the day we we're born. We don't learn to speak it straight away, but we certainly learn to hear it. Um, and so I, th you know, I, I think these things all interact. Um, but practically speaking, I think there's loads to explore where these things are somewhat separate. So exactly like we have some recent work where we take a big language model and we try and see what it can do when we introduce more visual perception to it. There's lots of other work like that. Um, I think there's loads to explore that. And actually, you know, there's nothing really ecologically uh, or principled about the three-way interaction that I was referring to. Like, I just think that there needs to be some interaction between these three components. Um, but I wouldn't say that they necessarily need to be orders. I, I do think ultimately you do probably want a process that's not that modular. So the, the winning thing will probably not have too many frozen weights in the sense that um, ultimately these things do need to inform and the updates of the other ones. But practically speaking, for a while at least, I think there will be quite a lot of frozen weights because we don't have good solutions for systems which learn at different timescales in different parts of the system or update with different amounts depending on different parts of the system. So one way of approximating that is to have frozen weights, um, which I think is, 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 is really promising as well. So, yeah, hopefully that's some answer, but it's a great question. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks a lot. I think we ran out of time, so I would just like to thank you one more time for, for the great talk and for having you at Star Summit 2021. So this concludes the session. And yeah, for Star Summit attendees, we'll be starting at uh, 5, 5.30 Central European time, 4.30 UK time. And I can't count other time zones right now. Thanks, thanks a lot.